Hey everybody and welcome back to another installment of Islam versus Christianity. I am Rodney Hall, pastor at Destiny Outreach and it's good to have you with me today. Today we're going to look at the Antichrist and the false prophet as they are perceived by both Christianity and by Islam. So differing approaches, same names, but uh, let's take a quick look. Revelation chapter 13 verses 1 through 8 in the New Living Translation says, Then I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. It had seven heads and ten horns with ten crowns on its horns, and written on each head were names that blasphemed God. This beast looked like a leopard, but it had the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave the beast his own power and throne and great authority. I saw that one of the heads of the beast seemed wounded beyond recovery, but the fatal wound was healed. So here we see the Antichrist in the imagery of the Antichrist rising up out of the sea, seven heads and ten horns, the, the, the ten horns representing power and authority, the ten crowns representing rulership. And we see that he gets his power from the dragon, or in other words, Satan. So this is in the Christian Bible. We see the rise of the Antichrist in the last days. It goes on to say, The whole world marveled at this miracle and gave allegiance to the beast. They worshipped the dragon and giving the beast, for giving the beast such power. And they also worshipped the beast, who is as great as the beast. They exclaimed, Who is able to fight against him? Then the beast was allowed to speak great blasphemies against God, and he was given authority to do whatever he wanted for 42 months. And he spoke terrible words of blasphemy against God, slandering his name and his temple. And the beast was allowed to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And he was given authority to rule over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all the people who belonged to this world worshipped the beast. They are the ones whose names were not written in the book of life before the world was made, the book that belongs to the Lamb who was slaughtered. And of course, we see Jesus as the fulfillment of the Passover Lamb in the Old Testament. He was crucified during Passover. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Anyone who is destined for prison will be taken to prison. Anyone destined to die by the sword will die by the sword. This, this means that God's holy people must endure persecution patiently and remain faithful. Then I saw another beast come up out of the earth. He had two horns like those of a lamb, but he spoke with the voice of a dragon. So now we're seeing another beast come forth, but instead of having ten horns, he only has two horns like those of a lamb. We know that Jesus is the Passover lamb. We just talked about that. So this would be like those of a lamb. So this would be the false prophet. And now we're going to take a look at how the false prophet interacts with the Antichrist. So it goes on to say, he had two horns like those of a lamb, but he spoke with the voice of a dragon. So he looks like prophet Jesus, but he actually speaks with the devil's voice. He exercised all the authority of the first beast, so in other words, he is the right-hand person, and he required all the earth and its people to worship the first beast. He points to the first beast, the Antichrist. And he required all the earth and its people to worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. He did astounding miracles, even making fire flash down to earth from the sky while everyone was watching. And with all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he deceived all the people who belong to this world. So people who belong to the world instead of to the kingdom of heaven, they are deceived by the false prophet. This is, again, Revelation 13, 1 through 18. He ordered the people to make a great statue of the first beast who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. He was then permitted to give life to this statue so that it could speak. Then the statue of the beast commanded that anyone refusing to worship it must die. So if you don't worship the beast or the Antichrist, you must die. Then the statue of the beast commanded that anyone refusing it must die. He required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or on the forehead. We know this is the mark of the beast. 
which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. Wisdom is needed here. Let the one with understanding solve the meaning of the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Now, many people have tried to figure out exactly what this is, and there's been a lot of speculation about it. The truth of the matter is the Bible tells us that the reason revelation was given is so that we might have understanding and be prepared for the day that's ahead. So it's more important that we understand what the Word of God says so that when it comes, we recognize it. Not to try to put a firm, this is what it is, or that's what it is. It's a, it's a little thing in your hand, or it's a tattoo, or it's a, a UPC code. Or, that doesn't really matter. What matters is, is that we know what the Bible says so that when we see it, it's obvious to us that that's what it's talking about. Revelation 20, it's beginning in verse 4, says, Then I saw thrones, and the people sitting on them had been given the authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony about Jesus. I think this is very important here that we realize we're talking about people who have been beheaded for the testimony about Jesus, about what they had to say about Jesus. So if they had a certain thing to say about Jesus, they lost their heads, okay? Let's keep that in mind. And for proclaiming the word of God. They had not worshiped the beast or his statue, nor accepted his mark on their forehead or their hands. They all came to life again and they reigned with Christ a thousand years. So the promise for those who lose their life at the hands of the Antichrist and the false prophet. Now let's look and see what it says in, uh, in the Islamic scriptures. It says, and because of their saying in boast, we killed Messiah Isa, or Jesus, son of Miriam, or Mary, the messenger of Allah, but they killed him not. Remember what I told you earlier uh, when we looked at Jesus and Isa, we said that they do not believe that he actually died. This is where this comes from, uh, Anissa 4, 157, and it says, uh, but they killed him not, nor crucified him, but the resemblance of Isa or Jesus. So someone was made to look like him who was put over another man. Some Muslims teach that this was Judas who had betrayed Christ, and so God made him look like Jesus so that he would die on the cross. Of course, our scripture tells us that Judas went back to the field that was purchased with the blood money and hanged himself. So uh, diff definitely different story here. And those who differ therein are full of doubts. They have no certain knowledge. They follow nothing but conjecture. So in other words, they're saying we're the ones who uh, make, made all this up, not them. Even though ours was written 600 years before theirs was, or a little more. Um, for surely they killed him not. So they're absolutely certain that Jesus did not die on the cross according to that. So we see these ideas of Jesus as is seen in the Islamic scriptures and Jesus as seen in the Christian scripture. And the thing that's interesting to me as we look at that scripture back in Revelation 13, the beheading, or Revelation 20, the beheading, we see the, the false prophet, we see the Antichrist. Um, it would be easy for us to look at this based on what I've already told you about the Mahdi and the Isa, as they come back, the Mati is ruling everything. Uh, Isa comes back, destroys this false Dajjal, um, and now all of a sudden he is making everybody remember he abolishes the tax. So now all of a sudden everybody has to either convert or die. And of course the favorite mechanism of extremist Islamists is beheading. Uh, they're also crucifying people in parts of the world right now. You can see that uh, in, different, in different places. So crucifixion, but most of all, beheading is the most popular uh, thing. So it's real easy to see why Christians might take a look at these scriptures and believe that the very people that Islam is teaching are going to be the Mahdi and Isa, or who they call Jesus, um, that in actuality, according to Christian scripture, this is actually the Antichrist and the false prophet. Now there's a lot of different conjecture. I know Joel Richardson believes that the uh, the one who they destroy is Jesus. Um, and there's, there's some interesting evidence of that. Um, keep in mind, first of all, that this is prophecy. So just because they say it's going to happen doesn't mean it's going to happen. But it does, it does conjure up a, an interesting idea because we see them preparing for war. We see their version of Isa come back 
And then we see this, who they're calling the false antichrist, and we're seeing this battle, this struggle coming together, who Islam believes they're going to win it. Uh, but if that were, for example, the battle of Armageddon, then we know that Jesus, actually, the Christian Jesus, is the one that wins that battle and casts the antichrist and the false prophet into the lake of fire. So uh, some interesting things to consider. There's a lot of things we could look at and talk about and study, but hopefully this is giving you a good overview today of, um, of some of the differences so that when people on the news just flippantly say, you know, it's the same thing, they're all talking about the same God. Uh, no, we're not, we really aren't. And it's really an important decision that you make. This is an eternal decision that you have to make to decide. Choose you this day, as, the, as Joshua said, who you will serve. As for me and my house, I can tell you, we will serve the Lord. Let me pray for you right now. Father God, I just pray that you'll give wisdom and insight into each and every person who's watching today. I thank you that they're here. And I pray that this has been an encouragement to their soul that has better prepared them to understand the issues of eternity and has better understood them to have this discussion with their friends and neighbors. I thank you for it. I bless your name. You are our great God, Jehovah. And we pray it all in the precious name and through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.